Welcome, Word of Life family and guests. God's Word says that He inhabits the praises of His people, and He's looking for worshipers. We want God in our midst, because when His presence is here, there's fullness of joy, blessings, and lives are changed. So get ready for Him to speak to you today, not just during praise and worship, but from an anointed message from God's Word. Join us in worship as we build a place for God to dwell and get ready for a touch from heaven.
for working mightily in the lives of these. We thank you, Father, that the very same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is alive and working in the lives of these. And we thank you that every need is met according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Hallelujah. Good morning, Word of Life. It's Sunday the 12th. And here's all the ways coming up that you can get connected. Hey, young adults, my name is Terrence. And I'm Kamika. And we want to invite you to our next young adult service. It's going to be November 17th at 7 p.m. It's going to be upstairs in the fellowship hall. And yes, child care will be provided. We want you to remember it's the third Friday of this month instead of our normal fourth Friday. So we look forward to seeing you there for a great time of worship, fellowship, and just connecting with other young adults and experiencing God's presence. If you're 55 or older, we've got a lunch that's just for you. Tomorrow we have lunch at noon in our fellowship hall and we want you to be there. It's a great time of fun and fellowship plus a great meal. It's tomorrow at noon in the fellowship hall. Hey, I'm Lainey, I'm the kids pastor here. This Thanksgiving we're providing dinners for our families at Word of Life and our outreach families. And there are four ways that you can help. First, you can give in our special offering or you can go to our website or the information center and find the list of food items that we need and you can sign up to help us pack these boxes and get them delivered to these families. There's a perfect way for you to get involved, so let's make this a great Thanksgiving for our outreach families. If this is your first time here at Word of Life, we'd like the opportunity to meet you personally. Right after service, members of the staff will be in our guest center, which is located just outside the doors, and we'd love it if you come by and let us meet you this morning and pick up a free gift we have for you. And if you can't stop by today, that's no problem. In the seat in front of you, there's a card that says I'm new here. You can fill that out and drop it in the offering in just a few minutes. Here at Word of Life, there's a perfect place for you to be connected. Somewhere you can grow, use your gifts, and be a life giver. So this week, find a life group or event that's right for you. And you can make it your point of connection. Good morning. Okay, can I get a little bit of good morning? Good morning. Okay. Oh, I like that. Oh, that section's good. Good job. Okay, I am Lainey. If y'all didn't notice, that was me on the video. Everybody notice that? It's me. Okay, so I'm Lainey. I am over the kids department here at Word of Life Center, Kids World. And I just want to say welcome, family, Word of Life family, and welcome to our guests. I'm so glad you guys are here. And um, if you are a guest, we'd like to get some more information about you. There's a card in the seat in front of you that you can fill out and completely fill it out legibly as well, please. And um, you can put it in the offering bucket in a minute, or you can come back after service right behind the doors at the guest center. And um, I will be there. A few of our other staff will be there. Pastor will be there. And we all want to meet you and um, try to get you connected. So there's something else that, at my video that um, we're doing this Thanksgiving. We're doing some Thanksgiving boxes for our outreach families. So I just want to let you guys know how you can get involved. We're doing it um, next Sunday and Monday and Tuesday. We have it for our outreach families. We have um, boxes with non-perishable items and a turkey that we have at the Information Center more info that you can get a list of items if you want to donate it or you can come out on Monday, Tuesday or Sunday, Monday or Tuesday, come up in the fellowship hall, help us pack those boxes and deliver them to our family, all, all our outreach families. So if you want to get more involved with that, you can go online on our website and sign up or you can go to the information center. And I ask that if you can't give items or give your time, that you give your time in prayer with us. We need prayer covering us all the time in outreach when we go in the neighborhoods. We have outreach this Saturday at Airport Park if any of you want to come. I got my own plug, sorry. Um, so if you want to come Saturday at Airport Park, we'll be there at 9.30. And um, this is something we do every month with our outreach, so you're welcome. And um, I just want to thank you for coming today and welcome our pastor. Hallelujah. Normally you come up right behind everybody else. Do what? Normally you come up right behind everybody else. I didn't want to scare you. I scared you the first service. <laughs> I'm going to embarrass her, though. She, we, Beck and I were talking 
of all our kids, she would be the one that would be the least one I think would be standing up here <laughs> when she was little. She was so shy. Somewhere she lost that. I don't know. So, praise the Lord. We want to receive our offering. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to share this with you real quick. Before I do this, I want to show you a picture real quick. Picture real quick. There you go. This is Arissa. You don't know her. I have never met her, but Becky and I have been supporting her since she was a baby. She is a uh, she is at uh, Living Word Ministries International, which is Charlie and Kathy Millbrot. And uh, this is this young lady was an orphan, and uh, Becky and I just took it upon ourselves to to take care of her. Send her monthly support. We bought her Christmas, birthday, everything. Uh, she was born in 1998, July the 20th. She just started college this year. Now, I'm not saying this. I have a point to this, so I'm not saying this to brag at all, so please don't misunderstand it. But um, we're sending her to college. We're, go we're going to send her to college. We, got, we bought her a, um, a motorbike and a laptop. To go, to go to college, and so we're going to support her all the way through her college years, and I believe she's going to marry a preacher and preach the gospel all over the world. She loves Jesus. Amen? Now, I'm going to leave that up there because I want to just share this with you. Um, the life of a church is in its giving. Uh, if any church turns away from giving, they're really turning away from the next generation. Because if you're not careful, you can get so inverted about your ideas and your desires toward the things of God. And, and I know there are a lot of churches today, and I'm not mocking them, not making fun of them, but I'm going to tell you it's going to hurt them in the end, is they don't take up offerings. Well, we don't want to offend anybody. Listen, don't get mad at me, but I want to offend you. Amen. I want to challenge you, yeah. amen, to be a giver because the life of a church is in its giving. Uh, and listen to this carefully because I, I have a point here. It, <clears throat> it's the seed not only for your sowing, but it's also the fact that you're sowing toward another generation. You're sowing toward someone else. We're, we're sowing into this young lady's life because of our, uh, of our giving. When you give to missions, you're sowing to another generation. Even when you give into the local church, you're sowing to the next generation. We're sowing to, that other people will come, that God will touch people, that God will minister to people. And sometimes I think we have the attitude that generations are lost. You know, well, I'll tell you what, this new generation... These millennials. You know, I remember hearing my dad rag on me. Well, I tell you, if you'd ever learn how to work. I tell you, I was working, and he was, when I was young. And I was too, but I mean, it, it was just like, you know, I walked 40 miles to school in the snow every day. He didn't go but through the eighth grade, so he didn't, you know, but maybe that's why. But... But, uh, and that's not a bad thing about my dad. He was a worker. But every generation. But listen, there, I don't believe God is losing any generations. I believe every church, if they'll sow into the things of God, even your tithes and offerings are sowing into the next generation. Go over to the youth building and see. I mean, or in the children's ministry, we're sowing constantly into another generation. And I saw this at work. My pastor uh, was John Osteen. Now, most of you have never heard of John Osteen, but you might have heard of his son, Joel. Okay? Well, that is a product, Joel is a product of sowing by his father to another generation. That church taught me how to give. What you hear today about giving, I learned there. 
And now you see what's happened to the next generation and what God's doing. And it all because, comes because we don't give up in our giving. We're sowing not only to get a need met, but we're sowing to another generation. One of my scriptures that we're praying right now in, uh, in Monday night prayer is Isaiah 44, verse 3. Isaiah 44, verse 3. Listen to what it says. I will pour water on him who is thirsty, floods on dry ground. I will pour my spirit on your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. Don't ever think, well, I tell you, that generation, they're dry, they're, you know, they're godless, they're not serving God. No, they just need a little water. No, they just need a little water. We're going to water them. And your giving does that. It's watering, it's sowing and producing to another generation. So don't ever give up on your giving. Don't ever think that it, you, you will not know till you get to heaven the power and the impact of your giving. I'm just telling you, you won't know. But when you do, you're going to say, thank God I listened to Pastor Sam. Thank God I didn't get offended and I didn't give up in my giving because I sowed to another generation. Yes. Amen. Amen. So as you give today, just keep that in your mind, in your thinking, that you're doing something powerful today when you give. Amen. Amen. You ready to give? Yes. If you're bold enough, hold your offering up before the Lord. I'm going to pray over it with you and believe with you today that God's going to do something for you and for the seed that you sow. Father, you see these givers today. Thank you that they're giving, Father. Thank you for the, for the privilege of receiving their tithes and offerings into the kingdom today. And Father, I thank you as they plant, you've promised that you'd cause it to come back to them. But Father, you also said, we're sowing to another generation to see more of the kingdom of God expand and grow. And we're just planning for that right now. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. Everybody agree, say amen. amen. After the bucket's passed, stand up and let's worship the Lord together. stand up and worship with us this morning we are going to set our attention on Jesus on his beautiful face and meditate on all that he's done for us and the power that's in his name Jesus we exalt you in this place there is power in your name mighty power in your name oh Jesus Oh, we thank you, Lord. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain. Oh, there is power. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power.
it's a name, and it's Jesus. The word has a name, and it's Jesus. Redemption has a name, and it's Jesus. It's holiness. Holiness has a name, and it's Jesus.
Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for what you were willing to do for us. Thank you that you were willing to come down and die for us and provide your name for us to live by. And in your name is everything we need. We glorify you, we magnify you, we give you glory and honor. Thank you for speaking to us today, working in our midst. Thank you for the life that you bring. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise be to God. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ooh, you just can't get this anywhere else. I don't mean another church. I mean anywhere else. But in, th- in church. The presence of God. Thank you, my Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. <clears throat> Several weeks ago, the Lord just really began to stir in my heart. And really, to be honest with you, the Lord didn't tell me to preach this. I wanted to preach this for Him. Does that make any sense to you? Sometimes, you know, He'll give you a direction. And, but, you know, I, I really felt like I wanted to share some things, and I wanted to say them for Him. So the title of this series I started last Sunday is called The Actions of God. It's God acting toward us, moving for us. And, and if you don't understand, you know, I know everybody, well, God so loved the world. I think we've almost made that a cliche. We don't have a clue what that really means. We don't even really understand what, what his desperate desire is for his people. But I'm going to inform you. That's my job. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to read uh, 2 Corinthians beginning uh, in chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Listen to what it says. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Now listen to the next verse. It's very important. Listen. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, I want you to notice what it says here. It says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now, stop and think of it. Let me read this out of the Amplified Bible. Listen. It was God, personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself, not counting up, holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them and committing to us the message of reconciliation, of restoration to favor. Now, I want you to notice something. Did you notice that you didn't have anything to do with that? That was all God. It was all God toward you. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now, now the reason I'm saying this is because you've got to understand that there was absolutely nothing you could do. The only thing that could be done had to be done through God. Amen? And so the, main, the amazing thing to me is that it says that he's not counting up or holding against men their trespasses, canceling them, committing to us the message of reconciliation. Now, you know, you can misread that, and if you're not careful, you can get in serious trouble. Well, you know, God sent Jesus to die for our sins, so we don't have to worry about sin anymore. Everything's going to be all right. Wrong. You missed something. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. If you're not in Christ, you're not reconciled. Amen. Amen. You you have to understand that, that God acted toward you, and he only acted toward you through Jesus. 
No other way. And so if you don't get that, and you're going to misunderstand that. You're going to think, well, I can just kind of do what I want to do. Everything's going to be all right. You know, that's going to be cool. Yeah. Well, you're mistaken. Because God did what he did in Christ. And, and, and so all the reconciliation that happens is through him. Everybody still with me? So here's my question. How did we get to this point? Where God had to reconcile, restore to friendship and harmony to change us from enemies to friends. How did we get to that point? Oh, it was Adam and Eve eating that apple in the garden. Well, I think, I, I, I just hate to tell you this, but I don't think it was an apple. Amen. Yes, Adam and Eve transgressed in the garden, but I want to tell you something. That's not the whole problem. And if you don't get the whole picture, you're never going to understand the power of God's actions toward you through Jesus. And, and in order to understand this, you've got to understand why this thing started in the first place, how it got off, and what God has done by His own will to get you back again. He created the universe for you. He created everything for you. Then he created you. And then you, through Adam, pardon the expression, screwed up. <laughs> Amen. Okay. But now listen to me. It's amazing to me that God said, okay, but I'm going to fix it. No, no. God's not going to fix it. He's going to make it new. And, and so he started... He, he has started backward. You know, in Genesis, and we're going to look at this today. In Genesis, he made everything else, then created man. Now that he's reconciling this thing, he's going to make, he recreates man, makes him a new creature first, and then everything else is going to take place later. Started it just backward. Just flipped it. Started, uh, so the new creation was first. And he put the new creation on the earth that was in trouble. So, you've got to understand how we got to this place and the acts of God toward us to put us where we need to be. Because it was purely God. It wasn't you. It was God acting toward a lost humanity that was not capable of getting themselves where they needed to be. Well, you know, I know God, I know God loves us and, and uh, you know, and, you know, I know he, he sort of cares about us. Oh, no, no, no. It, it goes so far beyond that. It's, it's just un unbelievable. If you ever get a revelation of what I'm sharing with you, um, you'll realize, oh, my God, God did this and he did it all by himself. Now, what I'm going to tell you today is not a fantasy or a fairy tale. It's not a creation of the imagination of the mind. It's what the Word of God says. No one in the world has an explanation for where we are today and where we began if you're not a Christian. All you've got speculation. We've got facts. We've got facts. We got we we know. We know where we came from, we know where we are, and we know where we're going. And if you don't have that kind of perspective, you're not going to be able to even deal with daily life. You're just going to kind of do it the best you can and hope the Lord helps you a little bit. Well, when you start getting a revelation of His desire and His actions toward you, uh, it won't be that way at all. God has always, from the beginning of time, acted toward men from creation. As soon as man fell, we found this out last week, he had a plan in place to buy man back into his favor, into his grace, immediately. We didn't earn it, he just did it. And he set it in the motion from the very beginning, from the foundation of the earth. All God is doing, has done, 
is all about you. Because you're his creation. And you're different. Listen to me, you are different. You're not like any creature. You're God's creation. Are y'all still with me? Why are you different? Let me tell you the main reason that you're different. You have a will. You chose to be here this morning. Some people chose not to be here this morning. Now, do you understand what I'm saying? You choose. You choose. You have a will. No animal has a will. I know, I, I said this yet last week, little fluffy, you think he just, he can just, he knows what to do and, and oh, he's got a will of, oh, you know, he's just like a person. No, he's not. No, they're not. I'm sorry to tell you. Oh, wow, your mind's different. No. No, I know. I heard that. Somebody, well, you don't know my fluffy. God created you in his image. Y'all got it? In, your, in his image. Yes. That means he gave you what he's got. Yes. And that means he's got a will. That's why Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane was dropping blood out of his pores, fighting against his will and the will of God. Yes. Not my will, but your will be done. I'm not going to do what I want to do because I want to call 10,000 angels and rip this thing apart. But I want to do what you want. And I release my will to your will. Okay? So you got to understand that. You are not, you're not a lightweight. Now, I'm going to add something to this this morning. Kind of an asterisk. My fear is that by sharing what I'm going to share with you today... It might not seem to connect with where you are today. You know, people are looking for, give me an answer today. But if you understand where you came from and what God has done for you, all of a sudden you're going to start having faith for what he will do for you now and what he'll do for your future. So uh, it's critical to your spiritual understanding to know what is really happening today in our world based on what God is doing. This is about light and darkness. Do you understand that? This is about light and darkness. And darkness has a name, just like Jesus has a name. Darkness has a name, and his name is Satan. We call him the devil. He's also called Lucifer. If you don't understand this battle of light and darkness, and it's not an equal battle, don't kid yourself. But it is a battle. And it's a battle on purpose. And if you understand why, then you understand why the Bible says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. But if you don't understand how this thing got to where it is, you're going to miss it. So my, my, my concern is, you're not going to apply this to yourself. It's going to sound like a fairy tale, but it's not. And I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you from the Word of God, it's not. Okay? So I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. If you can't find that scripture, <laughs> come see me after the service. Open your Bible to the first page. How about that? Well, it says index. Well, I'll turn one more page. <laughs> hey, I'm not mocking you. When I got saved, listen, I didn't know a Bible. I didn't know an apostle from an epistle. I didn't know the books of the Bible. I, could only, I did know Genesis was the first one, but that was it. And from, for probably six months, I had to keep my finger in that index. And when they'd say turn to Judges, I'd have to flip and find out where Judges was to turn to it. So I understand that, but anybody can find Genesis, right? So, so let's jump into this, and, and uh, let's look at some, the actions of God here, okay? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God 
created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, you've got to understand something about what I'm going to tell you today. I'm going to show you what the Word of God says so you won't get this confused with, oh, that's just Pastor Sam's doctrine. It is my doctrine, but I believe it's the Word of God. And, it, and if you'll understand and hear what the Spirit of God's saying, it will help you today. Okay? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, I'm going to make this statement to you. Somewhere in the dateless past, God brought the heavens and the earth into being. I don't want to shock you, and I know this may shock some of you. Well, I, I believe in creation. You do. Yeah, I believe God created this whole thing, you know, 6,000 years ago. Well, it, he didn't. And the Bible doesn't teach that. He created man 6,000 years ago. But he didn't create the, he didn't create the heavens and the earth 6,000 years ago. Now, it's important that you know this. You know, oh, this is a history lesson. Well, it is a long way back history lesson, isn't it? Okay. But it's more than that. You've got to understand this to understand the actions of God toward you and what his whole desire is in this whole thing. So somewhere in the dateless past, God brought the heavens and the earth into being. Hebrews 11.3 says this. Listen. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. It's this important. So that things which are seen are not made of things which are visible. God created the heavens and the earth out of something we don't know. We don't know. We don't know what he, we don't know. He just, he did it. Everybody still here? Okay, he did it. But what you've got to understand is that Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, is not a summarizing statement of the following verses. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and then the earth was void and without form. Like it's a continuation, or it's just, uh, oh, God did this, and this is how he did it. That's not true. And I'm going to show you from the Word of God, it's not true. And it's important that you know this. Because I tell you, you're going to be a terror to the devil if you hear what I'm saying today. Okay? Listen to me very carefully. Carefully. Verse 1 and verse 2 are separate acts of God. Beginning in verse 2. Separate acts of God. Verse 2. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Water covered the earth. Okay? Okay? Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. All right, now here's, here's what you've got to understand. Verse 2 is the beginning of, an, of, a, of God giving us light into the rehabilitation of the earth. I know this sounds like a history lesson, but listen to me. It is important that you get this. It is a a direction, an understanding of the rehabilitation of the earth. Let me explain it to you this way. God told Adam to replenish the earth. He didn't tell him, go out and enjoy what I've created for you. He said, you got work to do. You're going to have to name all these animals. You're going to have to replenish the earth. Something had changed between verse 1 and, 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 the, and, the, and then the creation of man. The second thing about this is this. In verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1, it says God created the heavens and the earth. That word is the Hebrew word bara, and I'm sure that's not how you say it, B-A-R-A. -A. But, but it literally means to bring into being, completely bring into being. No existing material to bring into being. Y'all still here? All right. 
But when God created man in his image, the word there says he made something out of something that already existed. You do know that you're, you were made out of something, right? What's it called? Dirt. Dirt. You know, ashes to ashes. <clears throat> Years ago, I did a funeral. And it was the first one of the kind for me at the time. One of my church members. And it wasn't here at the church. It was actually at a, at a funeral home. And, and uh, it was a three and a half hour funeral. I hate to say this, but it was African American. White people don't do that. They just say so long. I'm going to say this. You probably, the African Americans, do you know why your culture takes so long at funerals? Does anybody know? Do you want me to tell you why? Because when, when your ancestors were slaves, and somebody died, it was the only time they were able to get together. And so they got together as long as they could. Go study history. That's, I, I wanted to know that. You don't care, but I wanted to know that. I'm your pastor. I want to know why you have a three-hour funeral. I mean, they passed the casket around through the aisles and had ladies with white hats on taking people out and I'm not mocking it. I'm just telling you that's, that's the way it was. Okay. So finally we're going to the cemetery and, um, we get to the cemetery and I'm, you know, I'm standing there ready to, you know, finish, finish up. And, and, um, one of the, um, directors from the funeral home came over to me and he said, you're going to do the dirt. I said, I, I tried my best to figure out what in the world is he talking about? Am I going to do? I thought maybe he wanted me to fill in the grave after everybody left. I didn't know what he meant. So finally, I just said, listen, I'm sorry, but I have no idea what that means. He said, you know, pick up the dirt, throw it on the casket and say ashes to ashes, dirt to dirt or dust to dust. Are you going to do that? And I said, no, I'm not going to do that. But you're just dirt. But listen, you were dirt. You weren't created, you were made. Do you understand the difference? Okay. It's important that you understand that. Okay. So you were made in God's image. You might want to go study that out some uh, because God um, made man and he formed the woman. To me, that just, that sounds right, doesn't it? He formed the woman. He just made the man. All right, I'm way off base here. And I got a lot to cover, so I got to get back here. So you understand the difference between create and made. So God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning, okay? And then he made man in his image, all right? But now here's the thing you've got to understand, okay? Listen to what it says in verse 2. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The whole earth was covered in water, Okay, so that's where you are in verse 2. But now listen to what it says in Isaiah 45, verse 18. Listen to this. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it. Now listen to this. Who did not create it in vain. Did not create it 
in vain. Now that doesn't sound like much until you find out what the word vain means. It means a waste, a desert, a desolate surface. Something happened between verse 1 and verse 2 to make the earth uninhabitable. Completely uninhabitable. Next Sunday, I'm going to tell you why. No, I'm going to tell you today. Okay. Because Job said that God planned this thing out. He measured everything. Measured the seas. Measured the earth. Measured the length. Measured the He measured everything. He, he, he had everything in perspective for what he wanted to do. But that's not what we see in verse 2. So what, what's the deal? Let me explain it to you this way, and I'll show you this, and this is going to help you. God said in, in verse 3, He said, let there be light. That is not a creation word. That's a permission word. It's expressing, it's expressing permission in connection with something that already exists. If I grab hold of your arm and you say, let go, I'm not going to have to create hands to let go. I just let go. Yeah. God said, let there be light. And what was he saying? I give permission to light to shine on the earth again. Psalm 104, verse 7, he said he did the same thing with the water. He rebuked the waters and commanded them to go back to their shore. Oh, that's Noah's flood. No, it's not. Just hang on. I'm going to show you. God was putting the earth back in a condition where man could be created. Made. I don't want to say create and get you confused. Made. Y'all still here? So, something happened between Genesis 1 and 2. So, what happened in Gen what, what What's going on here? Let me tell you what's going on. And I'm going to show you from the Word. There was another civilization on the earth before God replenished and recreated the earth. Look, I don't have an argument with scientists. Well, we found these fossils and they're a million years old. I don't doubt it. Well, the earth is, you know, cer certain hundreds of millions of years old. Or certain I don't doubt it. Even scientists now have pretty much figured out this whole thing started with a big bang. The problem is most Christians think it happened 6,000 years ago and scientists laugh at them. Because it didn't happen. It happened a long time ago. We've got the technology to, to figure that out. When they find these bones and these fossils and Jurassic Park stuff. <laughs> and we think, oh no, well that couldn't have been. But it was. Is it interesting that they're all dead? Nothing survived that so I know they think alligators and crocodiles and certain things like that did, but they didn't. Even if they did, it's no, it doesn't make any difference. Really. Something happened. Let me show you an interesting scripture again. Listen to this. Isaiah 45, verse 18. Thus says the Lord who created the heavens and earth, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain. Now listen to the last part of this. Who formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there's no other. He didn't form this thing to be a waste. He formed it to be inhabited. And it was. Now, I know, like I said, this may be a little tedious for you, but you just hang with me. There's a scripture that's been totally misunderstood in 2 Peter chapter 3. And it talks about, in, in verse 4, 
uh, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So this is not talking about Noah. This is talking about the beginning of creation. Verse 5 says, For this they willingly forget that the word of God, by the word of God, that the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Well, that's Noah. No, it's not Noah because it was from the beginning of the earth. Y'all still here? By which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. That's not the Noah's flood because it was from the beginning. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire unto the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Now listen to me a minute. What you've got to understand is that the world that then existed with Noah is the same world that exists today. The only thing different is there were a lot of dead people. <laughs> same world. What do you mean, Pastor? I'll tell you what I mean. This will help you understand it. Very simple. When Noah got off the boat, he got drunk. <laughs> Nothing changed. <laughs> the only thing that changed was there were a bunch of dead people because they were unrighteous and unholy and ungodly. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I don't want to get hung up on this because you've got to understand the whole picture here. So, so you had a civilization here. There was, a, there was a civilization. There were creatures on the earth. I don't know how long. I don't trust the scientists exactly as far as dates, but, but let's just say a million years. Some, some, some period of time. You know, when you're... When, when, you're, when you're not limited by a flesh and blood body, time doesn't mean a whole lot. You know, God, time means absolutely nothing to God. Okay. So, what, what was the deal? I'm going to tell you what the deal was. Isaiah 14, verse 12. Listen to what it says. How are you fallen from heaven, Lucifer, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? Now, listen to this. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne. He had a throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the congregation on the further side of the north. That's the high place. Next verse. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Here it is. I will be like the most high God. Lucifer had a kingdom. He had a throne. He still has a throne today. Go read it in Revelations. He still has a seat of authority today. It's not what it used to be, but it's still there. Where is it? I don't know. Everybody thinks their city is where the devil dwells. I talked to pastor, you know, that spirits are really strong in our city. Yeah, they're that way everywhere. Okay. So Lucifer had a kingdom because he had a throne. E Ezekiel 28 verse 12 says this. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. That's not a human, okay? The prince of Tyre was a human. This is not a, this is a king. This is talking about Lucifer. And it says to him, thus says the Lord, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Now listen to this. You were in the garden, Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sartus, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emeralds with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were what? Created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you by the abundance of your trading. You became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as profane. Y'all still with me? As a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery furnace. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor, and I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they may gaze at you. Pretty strong stuff. He had a kingdom, he ruled that kingdom. 
That's why we see what we see today from, from unexplainable, so to speak. But here's the interesting thing about it, okay? There were other rulers and powers involved in this thing. How do you know? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. That's not it. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. I think they're asleep back there. Listen to this. <laughs> to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God may be made known by the church, and listen to this, to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Paul said there were wicked rulers of darkness, wicked spirits, principalities, and powers. Where did they come from? Why is it that those spirits always want to possess a person? Pretty quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> I mean, I can speculate on some of this, okay? But the point is, you need to understand that Satan, called Lucifer at the time, ruled a kingdom on the earth, and there were people under his authority. A lot of people under his authority. I'm convinced from the Word of God that he actually was involved, led the pray. He was a music minister, if you want to call it that. He was the anointed sheriff who covered. The worship was his part. That's why the devil's involved with music today. It says he was the bright and shining one. But here's the problem that he had. He came up with the idea he would exalt himself to the throne of God and become like God. Not God, become like God. And be a ruler over more than what God had said. It said he was full of wisdom and beauty. He was in the original Garden of Eden. Say, what do you mean original? I'm convinced God had a Garden of Eden before, all, before we read in, in Genesis about the Garden of Eden. Why? Well, because God never changes. What He created, He doesn't change. He was created perfect. Iniquity was found in Him. And He was carried off by pride because of His glory or what He thought was His glory. All right, here's, here's the question. And I'm going to show you this from the Word, but I'm going to give it to you like this. Why did Lucifer rise up in pride and rebel against God? Was it just a whim? Did he just get to the point where he just thought he was cool enough to do it? Strong enough to do it? We're talking about real personalities here. Okay, this is not a story. This is not a fantasy. Okay, so you need to hear me. So, so what was it? Let me tell you what I believe it was. And the reason I'm saying this is because I believe God never changes. And I'm going to show you this from the Word, so this will help you. And I'll get into it more next Sunday. But listen, I believe that God went back to His original purpose before the fall of man, before God had to recreate the earth, I believe God's full, complete intention was to create a man and put him on the earth and that Lucifer would have to submit himself to that man that God created. No question about it. I, I'm, I'm convinced of it. And that's what triggered him to rebel. The problem is, and you know what? Today it's the same thing. People, they rebel and they, they, they do the stupidest things when they rebel. The devil, it, 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 was, it was unbelievable that he did it. But when he rebelled, listen to what it says in Revelations chapter 12. This is past tense in Revelation, not future. War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, that's Lucifer, and the dragon and his angels fought, and his angels fought. They did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him, then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, 
Now salvation and strength and kingdom has come to the kingdom of God. The power of his Christ has come for the accuser of the brethren who accused them before God night and day has been cast out. Jesus said it like this in Luke chapter 10, verse 18. I beheld Satan cast out of heaven as lightning from heaven. God kicked him out of heaven so quick he burned rubber. I mean, he came out so quick he, he was smoking when he hit the earth. Y'all still here? I mean, it was, it, was, it was that quick. It wasn't even a fight. It wasn't even worth the challenge. And Satan and all of his angels were cast down to the earth without the ability to do what they had done in the past. Now, there's a lot more to this, okay? Did you ever wonder why the heavenly utensils had to be cleansed? Okay, it's because Satan was involved. All right, listen. So iniquity came on the earth. So you know what the Lord did? He said, I'll fix this. I'll deal with this. Isaiah 24, verse 1. Listen to what it says. Now, this is the New King James. It says, Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it a waste. Now, listen to this phrase. Distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. The word there, distort its surface, in the Hebrew says, He turned the world upside down. Now, there are scientific theories, and I've actually read these, where it says that, they, that that's how the ice age that we know happened, happened, that killed all of the creatures that were on the earth, is because somehow, they say, a meteor hit the earth and turned it upside down. See, Australia is supposed to be in the northern hemisphere, and we're supposed to be in the southern hemisphere. God turned this thing upside down. What happened? It produced an instant ice age. Water covered the earth. And then it froze because when it covered the earth, listen to me, it produced clouds and blocked the sun and became a frozen waste. Y'all still here? Becky told me to quit saying that so much, but I want to make sure you're here. So, you got, this, you got this world that's desolate. So what happened? Well, God started all over again. And that's where verse 2 starts. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was on the face of the deep. The Spirit of the Lord hovered over the face of the water. And God said, let there be light. And God gave light the order to function properly. He commanded the waters to go back into their original places. He created the animals and the creatures. And then he created man in his image. And told him to replenish the earth and have dominion over it. Dominion over it. But you and I both know that the devil was here. And all of those spirits were here. But they should have had no place at all, no authority at all over man. Satan had to deceive man in order for man to give up the authority that he had. And when man transgressed, it gave some dominion or some authority back to the enemy, back to the devil. Let me read it to you. This, listen to what it says in Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. The devil, taking Jesus on a high mountain, showed him, now listen to this, all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give to you. And this glory, for this has been delivered to me. And I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, you will worship before me and it will be yours. And Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Do you know what Jesus came to do? He came to defeat the devil and get our dominion and authority back. And the devil said, you know what? You don't have to do that. All you have to do 
is worship me and I'll give it to you. Thank God Jesus was smarter than we are. He was smarter than we are. Well, that, that was just the devil trying to trick Jesus. Then it wouldn't have been a temptation. You know what Jesus would have said if it hadn't been the truth? Devil, you know better than that. That ain't no temptation to me. You know better than that. No, no. It was a temptation. But see, God had a plan that would not only give Jesus the authority back, but it would restore you and restore me to our rightful place of authority and let us be what God wants us to be. Now, I'm going a little long today, but you've got to hear the rest of this, all right? Now, I want you to consider what I'm going to read to you now. Jesus' inauguration in heaven, because that's what it is. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13. No, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let, let me read you this first. I'm sorry. Let, let's re, let, read verse, verses 3 and 4 first. Hebrews 1, 3 and 4. Talking about Jesus. Who being the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having, now listen, this is important, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. He had a better name than the angels, including Lucifer. All right, now listen to verse 13. Listen to what it says. To which of the angels, you got to read Lucifer in there. He's one of them, right? Has he ever said, I like that. Has he ever said, sit on my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? You know what God said? I ain't never said that to an angel. I just want you to know, Lucifer, I never said that to you, nor did I ever want you to try to come up here and sit by me. You have no authority. You have no power. I just want you to know I never said that, ever. <laughs> Glory to God. He never said to Lucifer, sit with me in my throne. I like this translation. Asso associate with me in royal dignity. To be honest with you, and I may get into this next Sunday. He really wanted Jesus' place, not the, not the Father's. He wanted Jesus' place. That's why Jesus was the only one who could come. Okay. Now listen to what it says in verse 8. To the Son, He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of of your kingdom. Your throne, O oh God, is forever. Now, here's the thing you've got to understand. Listen to this. It says in verse 14, Are they not all, talking about angels, ministering spirits, sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? God just turned this thing back to what He started. This isn't anything new. He's just having to, to go about it different. Because of what happened with Adam and Eve in the garden. The devil and all of those spirits and angels that were under his authority, they're just ministering spirits. They were supposed to minister to us. They weren't supposed to have any power, any authority. They're supposed to minister to us. Now they're going to be locked up forever. We read that last Sunday. Locked up forever. God's got a place reserved for him. He said, I got you covered, dude. You're gone. You're out of here. I know the Lord doesn't talk like that, but anyway. So here's the thing you've got to hear today. God's actions all toward you. Jesus died for you. Why? To restore you to dominion, to restore you to authority, to restore you to what we're going to have for eternity. Okay. You've got to see yourself this way. You've got to know I am a created, recreated, born again child of God. This was for me and it's for me today. Listen to what it says, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. When we were dead in trespasses and sin, I'm going to, ask, I'm going to say it like this. God acted toward us and made us alive together with Christ 
By grace you have been saved. Now listen, and has raised us up where? Together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, I love this. Listen to the next verse. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. I've been raised up together with him far above. I, I wish I had time to get into it. You know, we don't see everything yet. So what do we see? We see Jesus. And if we see Jesus, we see us. Because we've been raised up together with him. We don't have to allow the enemy to control our lives. Jesus Jesus told the disciples, they said, hey, we want to sit with you in your throne. And Jesus looked at them and said, you don't know what you're saying. You don't even know what you're asking. Are you willing to drink the cup that I drink? And they said, oh, yeah. Yeah, right. Ask Peter about that. Yeah, sure you are. But then Jesus made an amazing statement. He said, but you will drink it. But see, we don't have to drink of the suffering that Jesus did. We drink of the cup. Of his shed blood. We eat of the bread of his broken body. Why? Because we've been seated together with him in heavenly places. Ephesians 3.10 says it was for a purpose. That he might show forth his wisdom. God might show forth his wisdom to all. Listen to the whole spiritual realm. All the principalities and powers in heaven. I just want you to know my man is above you. Just want you to know I created him and you minister to him. He is created in my image. That's who you are. That's why God acted toward you. That's why this whole thing is playing out. I know you got to live on this stinking earth and deal with life. Tomorrow you got to go to work. You know, you got to deal with people. You got to deal with situations. You got to deal with circumstances. But don't ever forget who you are. Don't ever forget what God has done for you. That His whole thing was for you. That your sin is not going to keep you away from your God. Well, the Bible says your sin separated you from God. It did till Jesus separated it from us. The Bible says he took our trespasses and our sins and he nailed them to his cross so we could be free. That's what God has for you today. That's who you are. And you might think I'm just a nobody. I'm just struggling with life. Oh, I got so many problems. You are a child of God. And your father who acted toward you still wants to act toward you and work in your life and work great things in your life. All you've got to do is make up your mind, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Bow your heads with me, please.